I think you've got a problem with pronouncing mechatronics, isn't it? That's the one. So we've got, we've got to work on that. We've got to work on that. Yes, yeah, we'll get there. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as I said in the morning, I've got loads of mistakes, all of them non-intentional. So please don't say anything if you see one of them. Just stay quiet. <laughs> Um, it's a pleasure to see you today. I've, I've learned so much this morning, so, um, so hopefully you, you will, you will um, benefit as well from this. Thank you. It's okay. It's working. Thank you. So um, I'm going to talk about something called the Harrand plane, um, and I'll explain where Harrand comes. It's, it's, a, it's a graphical method for visualizing the optimality of an elevated traffic design option. A bit of a mouthful. Hopefully it will become a bit clearer. Just say Harrand plane for the time being. Um, so... Uh, I'm only going to try to concentrate on five parts. So when you start seeing three, four, you, you can breathe a sigh of relief that we're getting near the end, so that you can pace yourself. <laughs> so it's five parts. Um, I'm going to talk about current practice in elevated traffic design, and I would really appreciate some feedback from consultants. I spoke to Adam Scott this morning before he left just to get an idea of what pe consultants use, and I think I know the answer, but we'll, we'll probably talk a bit about that. Where Harren Plain fits in, I'm going to give you an illustrative design example, and it's beautiful. It's just conclusions and further work after that. So... Very, very painless, hopefully. Uh, the current practice, I think, there are currently two design approaches. There's calculation and simulation. Um, and please, I don't want anyone coming out of here saying, I don't like simulation, I love simulation. But I think we've given up too early on calculation. One of the problems of simulation, I think, is that there's, there's some lack of transparency. With calculation, Peter Sumner is, is loves, I'm sure Len Housie, Len Housie is here as well, we, we, can see, we can see the numbers. We know what's there. And I don't think there's any problem with simulation. I think, as I said, I think we've, we've, jumped, we've jumped too early. So calculation. Calculation, basically, we have an equation or we have a method by which it's three numbers I think we want to come up with. Others, there are other numbers, but the three numbers. How many elevators? L. How fast? V. And what their capacity is. Basically, if we come up with these three numbers, there's zoning and so on. Yes, that's right. But these are the basic three numbers. If we come up with them, we've got a design. Calculation falls into two categories, I think. There's the, the one we, know, we all know very well, which is the analytical method by which we, uh, we have an equation. We derive the equation using principles of probability. Rory talked about, about that today. And it does really get very, very difficult at a very advanced stage. But we can have an equation. We calculate the round trip time. We divide it by the target interval. We get the number of lifts. Um, there are new numerical methods. Um, where, the, where the equations get stuck, numerical methods can help us. Um, and I, we can talk about Monte Carlo simulation, Markov chains, other areas. There are many tools now. Um, that can help us find the round trip time and do a calculation. Simulation then, <coughs> we use then simulation to evaluate uh, passenger average waiting time, passenger traveling time, and more importantly, the effect of group control algorithms. And if I look at consultants here, I mean consultants, uh, tell me if you disagree. Let me come, I'll come back to this slide. But I think from a practical point of view, what we actually do, most of us, we actually come up with a ballpark figure using calculation. So we come up with a starting point. And we say, this is where we're going to start from. That gives me comfort. We don't jump into simulation, do we? We don't jump directly into simulation. Uh, we do calculation. We, found, we find the number of lifts, speed, capacity. And then we go and fine tune, don't we? We simulate and we see the effect of what waiting time, is traveling time too long, and so on. That's a hybrid approach. Does, anyone, does everyone agree? Who agrees that that is the approach that they would use if they were doing traffic analysis? Great. Okay. Good. Let me just go back. I jumped that slide. I think simulation can also be further subdivided into two methods, into two um, schools. Discrete event simulation, where we, we look at events. We jump from one event to the next. Or time slice simulation. Elevate is a time slice simulation tool. There are discrete event simulation tools. Obviously, again, there's no one which is better. Each one can be used for what it is. If you want an energy model, for example, or a vibration model inside your simulator with the traffic model, you've got to use time slice simulation. You wouldn't be able to use an energy model in Elevate without a time slice simulation. But if you don't, want, if you don't have a continuous model, you can actually save time by doing a discrete event simulation like um, Connie's BTS. Okay, so the classical approach, we found the round trip time, RTT or tau, 
whatever you denote it by, divide by the target interval, which should be a user requirement. And then we, and then we go to simulation to do all of the uh, fine-tuning. And I think that's the hybrid approach. What I'm trying to say is the calculation is not dead. Calculation will still be there for some time, unless something comes up. We do need calculation. It does offer us the transparency. Okay, so where does this piece of work fall? Why this piece of work? Um, it's closely related to the calculation part. It gives us a methodology. In fact, if you look at the underlined, this is pointing, isn't it? If you look at the optima, it gives you an optimum solution in a clearly defined number of steps. What many people who start on traffic analysis struggle with, they come up with an answer. Where do they go next? Is this a good answer? Is this an optimum answer? I know the, ex the, the experts here would say, oh, it's easy. I know where to move to. We have that expertise. But if I started a training course now for people who'd never done traffic analysis before, they would love something like this because it gives them a clearly defined step. And that's where I was when I started teaching this to students. They don't have any expertise, but giving them a clear number of steps actually was ideal. Uh, so it's ideal for training and educational, but it's also ideal for software automation. If you just want a number of steps in software, then you can use this method. So let's see where, what the Harrant plane is. In fact, the Harrant plane is not the only method. We saw S. You saw the complex frequency domain S, two presentations. Um, S, actually, we also use something there, which is used in control system design. By a guy called Evans, 1948-1950. Without going into too much detail, it has an x-axis, it has a y-axis, and it can be used for control system design. So we use graphs, many graphs, in many applications. So the Harrington plane is saying, if I come to my user requirements, I basically start with a, an arrival rate, quantity, and uh, an interval, quality. So if you put one as an x-axis, one as a y-axis, we've got a plane. We have to meet both conditions of quality and quantity simultaneously. So I'm introducing something called, an, well, handy capacity we know. Richard talked about that. I'm just saying there's an arrival rate. Let's put it as supply and demand. So um, arrival rate is the demand. That's what we expect the passengers to arrive in and handy capacity. And it's expressed as a percentage of the building population in the busiest five minutes. Ideally, we'd like those to be equal if we don't want a wasteful design. Again, we have a target interval. And we want the actual interval to be equal to that. In practice, we can't achieve it exactly. So we will find as long as we have more than or equal, that's fine. Obviously, the quantity has to be more than and the quantity has to be better than. So um, obviously, this is less than or equal. If we have much more than, if we have HC much more than AR, it's a wasteful design. And if we have interval actual much less than interval target, again, it's a wasteful design. No one wants a wasteful design. So, if we now come to the Harrant plane, now Harrant comes from, the INT comes from an interval, Harrant comes from um, HC, the C is dropped, and AR is arrival rate. So that gives us a, an easy, quick acronym. The X-axis is the quality of service, the interval, and the Y-axis is the, uh, quality of, uh, the quantity of service, which is the handling capacity, and this is the quality of service. Every point on that plane would represent a design. It doesn't have to be an acceptable design, but it's a design. So every point will have an interval and a handling capacity. Now we have four cases. We want the handling capacity to be above this line. So we want to be somewhere up in those two rectangles, not down here. And we want the quality of service, the interval, to be less than. So we want to be in this area. So in order to be above this line and to the left of this line, we have to be in that rectangle. That is an acceptable solution. Anything much more above that is a, is a wasteful, and these three don't, don't meet it. That doesn't meet neither quality nor quantity. That meets the quality but doesn't meet, meet the quantity, which means it doesn't meet the design requirements. And that actually meets the quantity but doesn't meet the quantity. So we need to be somewhere down here. And in fact, the optimum design, theoretically, is that point there. If we can get to that point there, then we have actually an acceptable optimum design. And where the method also has a number of equations which allow the user, the uninitiated, 
the, the starter to be able to start from a starting value of P. If I can give him an, or an easy way to start from an acceptable value of P, then that will help him a lot. And that's, there are three equations in there which give us a starting value of P. And it's that nice yellow rectangle there. And what it is saying, if I'm going to design to an actual interval, a target interval, which the user gave me, whoever that user is. He said, for an office, I want 30 seconds. For a residential, I want 90 seconds. If I'm going to meet that, then I would expect the number of passengers accumulated waiting to get inside the lift to be calculated from that, because that's how many passengers are arriving per second. If I multiply the number of passengers that arrive per second, where U is the total building population, 300 is 300 seconds per five minutes, which is our standard, and AR is the percentage arrival rate, then multi that becomes lambda, what we call lambda, which is passengers per second. If I disappear for 30 seconds, which is what the interval is, then during that time, that many passengers would have arrived. So that's really the value we need to start from. That's P, which we need to start from and fill up. So if we've got a starting value for P, then we can calculate the round-trip time in whatever method you want, divide that by the target interval, which is another user requirement, and that gives us the number of elevators. Obviously, we can't have a fractional number of elevators, because if we look here, all of these lines represent the points on a, um, a given number of elevators. So if you have one elevator, obviously, that's an accept unacceptable design. No matter how you move on that line, you're not going to get into that rectangle. Again, for two, for three. Now, we have 3.4. We can't have a fractional number of elevators. So, in fact, we probably need to round up to four. So, that's, that's the first step. We have, uh, this is like lines of contours. You know, the, the contour lines where you're looking at an area and you have contour. All of these lines have the same number of elevators on them. Now, we also have the number of passengers. So, we can have more passengers and less passengers. And those, happily, they actually are perpendicular to the L. And in fact, that's, so if I have a constant number of passengers, I can move on any one of those points. If we let those intersect, now we have various points. So in fact, we start, we always start from that line. We find that the number of elevators is 3.4. I can't have 0.4 of an elevator. I can't buy one. So I need to round up. So when I divide, I go up to four elevators. I know definitely from that graph that I'm at the optimum place. So this is now a hypothetical optimum solution. We can't have 3.4 elevators. The, the act of rounding up from 3.4 to 4 moves me on that first arrow. And then from there, I'm offering a handling capacity which is higher than the arrival rate. So it will not happen in practice. And for those of you who use Elevate, are you familiar with up peak and um, enhanced up peak? The difference between up-peak and enhanced up-peak is the difference between this point. You wrote Rory. Rory was showing a higher arrival than required, a higher handling capacity than required. So, in fact, this iterative set of equations will move you from that point down to that point. So now you have an optimal solution. You could have ended up with five. You could have ended up with six if you'd used the wrong starting point. So what this is giving you is a tool to visualize the method but also get to the optimum in one step. And these are the set of equations which allow you to do that, up and then down again. You can see it much more clearly here. So the, the act of rounding up has moved us to this point, four elevators, and then the act of iteration brings us down to the actual interval. And in fact, if we go back up, we've met both conditions now. Handling capacity equals arrival rate exactly, and the interval, actual interval is less than the target interval which we were required to achieve. That summarizes the whole method, but it's in the paper. So let's take an example. Let's say an example which works well, and then see if we don't use the equations, what could happen. We have a building with a number of parameters. These are the user requirements. That's why I'll put them first. User requirements are 12% arrival rate, 30 second interval. We have a building with 12 floors. Floor height, population, speed. And if we go with the method, we find P initial, and it gives us 14.4. So we've calculated lambda, passengers per second, converted it to passengers per interval or passengers per car. So if we start from 14.4, it gives us six elevators are needed. 
And then we go from up-peak to enhanced up-peak, and it takes us to 12%, and the actual number of passengers is 12.83, 12 and the actual interval is lower than 30. I haven't got the number here. And the user knows that actually this is the fewest number of elevators. Let me ask you another question. If I said to you, you increase the speed slightly, and you might get a reduction in the number of elevators, would you go for that? Yes? Raise your hand if you do. If I said you just go up from 2.5 to 3, and you will actually reduce the elevators from 7 to 6, would you go for that? Most people would go. So what this method is assuming is the highest cost item is the elevators. If you have to increase, I'm not saying increase the sp speed to something ridiculous, a small increase in speed. So in terms of cost, we, I would say number of elevators the highest, then the speed because that will hit your headroom and uh, pit depth and motor size, and then the capacity if you've got obviously the shaft, shaft size. And in that order, that's what this method would minimize. A wasteful solution, let's see a wasteful solution. Let's say someone is, wants to start with 16 passengers. Then follow all of the equations, but not use the correct P initial value. If you start with 16 passengers, you would end up with seven elevators. Now, I know the experts among you would say to me, well, look, the interval is 20 seconds. Why don't I try to do that? You know it, but maybe other people don't know it. The uninitiated wouldn't know that. But in fact, we've started with a higher P, and we've ended up with seven elevators. By using the P initial, we've actually ended up with a more optimum design. We have three types of unacceptable solutions which happen in practice. We could have a too high P, and that gives us too many elevators, too low P, insufficient solution, and fixed L, sometimes the building owner says, you know, you have to have that number of lifts. We can see them graphically now. Have we, how much time have we got? Five? Nothing, <laughs> nothing, okay. Let me just show that, then and I'll jump to conclusions. So if we look here, this is the optimum solution. If we start with too high P, you end up, you start from this point, you go up, and then you go down. In fact, you've got five elevators when you could have achieved four. Starting with a very low value of P would move you to this point, which is unacceptable. And starting from a very high value of P, again, uh, would, would, would bring you down here, which is unacceptable. Okay, I'm going to, because we're short of time, I'm just going to show further work. And in fact, I'm just going to jump to this and show you. Further work, what can we do now? Well, in fact, it's a two-dimensional plane. What we'd like it to be is a three-dimensional space, and I think that's the next step. What we didn't realize with this is that actually this is for constant speed. It's implied in there. It's not written. If I change the speed from 1.6 to 2 meters a second, all of that graph would change. So if I did this a number of times for different speeds, I could have a third axis. But in fact, the third axis has to be linked to a user requirement and the user requirement is the average traveling time. What you will note from, from your experience, and I think a number of speakers spoke about that today, if you actually have a solution that meets the interval, which in a way meets the average waiting time, in a way, if there's no queuing, and meets the handling capacity, which in a way meets the quantity of service, you are not guaranteed to achieve the average traveling time. You might have a too long average traveling time, and I think as well someone showed that this morning. The, the Bruce. Bruce, you showed that this morning, yeah? where he showed actually the law firm sitting. The design was correct, but in fact, there was a very, very long average traveling time. If we go back to the user, we can introduce a third axis, which is average traveling time. And on that axis, you would have the speed as a set of curves in this way. Then you have three user requirements with a three-dimensional space, and that's the future piece of work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.